Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Today, I would like to talk about the week that changed the world back in 1972. That was the meeting in between President Nixon and the Chairman Mao. I believe many people do not really remember that historic event that much, but it really had a significant impact on how the relation in between the United States and China and the West and China in general developed. I've been following this, I've been reading uh, on this for about two years and more and more I get to the point, to the conclusion that that situation back then, 1972, February 1972, was very very similar to what we have today. And I do believe uh, from that event in uh, 1972, we can learn for the crisis and the tensions in between the United States, and even in between the West and China, uh, very much. There's a very famous quote, uh, who does not remember the history is doomed to repeat it. And I think exactly in this case, uh, it's really important to know the history. If you only look at it superficially, then you might say that back then many, many things were different, a different time, a different situation. But as I said, I've been looking at it for, for two years now, and the more I reflect on it, the more I get to say it's very much similar. Now, how was the situation? I mean, you might think uh, today it really looks bad in between uh, China and uh, the United States. And the whole world is in, not in balance anymore. But if you look back then, I think it was worse, right? So basically, you had China and, and the United States who fought two wars against each other, the Korean War, when they really fought against each other, and uh, the Vietnam War, where also both had troops there. And then we had the Cold War going on, uh, in between especially the United States and the Soviet Union. And uh, it really looked at the Soviet Union was on the rise. Uh, communism really seemed to be a danger and it was not at all clear that, uh, that uh, the Western world uh, would be strong enough to, to fight against it. And also in between the Soviet Union and China, there were strong tensions going on. So they had fights, they, the, the, the Soviet Union, they had the troops uh, up there in the northwest of China, the border of Xinjiang, and troops were fighting against each other. Um, China has become a nuclear power, and they just, uh, around that time, they, they dropped their, their, their second H-bomb. So also let's look at the domestic situation. In China, the Cultural Revolution was in full swing, and uh, during that time also there was a, a coup and the assassination attempt of Mao by his uh, marshal uh, Lin Piao, uh, whom, by the way, he wanted to see as, as, as his successor originally. Then back to the States, they had uh, racial unrest and they had uh, the anti-Vietnam War protests. So the United States was as divided as they haven't been since uh, the, the, the Civil War. So, all in all, the situation on both sides was uh, very bad. So that's when Nixon started to reach out to, to, to the People's Republic of China, to Mao. And for him it was clear that uh, the People's Republic of China could not be any longer excluded. So let's remember, right, that uh, since 1949, since Mao, and uh, his party came to power, they were totally isolated by the United States. So the United States purely and only talked to, to Chiang Kai-shek, who in 1949 went or had to go to Taiwan. So for them, the People's Republic of China didn't exist. So for him, it was clear that uh, in the long run, that could not uh, longer exist. So that's why he reached out. Uh, so in the first step in 1969, February 1969, he told his uh, back then security advisor, Dr. Henry Kissinger, that he should evaluate, but on total secrecy, how they, the United States, could 
improve the relation with the People's Republic of, of China. And it was very important that it's secret because Nixon knew very clearly that the Democrats and in his own party, Republicans, would roast him alive if they found out too early. Though in the meantime, he started to give some signals uh, to China, to the People's Republic of China. Um, for instance, he would draw some of the, the, the battleships from the, the Taiwan Strait, which was clearly noted by, by Mao and the People's Republic of, of China. And since this uh, first initiative, since Kissinger was told to evaluate about uh, how to improve relations in between the countries, again, that was in 1969, February 1969, so it took four years till 1972, February 1972, till finally Nixon met with Mao and till the famous uh, Shanghai communique was uh, signed. In addition, he believed that uh, he could use the help uh, from China in order to end the Vietnam War. Um, he believed that he, they could influence uh, North Vietnam and help him to, to get a good deal and to, to draw back from Vietnam without losing his face. Because that was uh, finally what uh, he promised uh, during his uh, presidential campaign to his, uh, his uh, voters that he will end uh, the Vietnam War. And of course, also he saw, Nixon saw the big, uh, the big uh, economic potential um, of, of China and to work uh, with China. On the side of China, on the side of, of Mao, uh, their main, main uh, struggle was, was, was Taiwan, because clearly since 1949, it was uh, very clear for China, for every Chinese leader, politician and so on, that Taiwan is, is a part of China and that there is only one China. And he was very much interested in order to, uh, to, 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 to negotiate on this and to have a, a clear, clear uh, commitment from the side of the United States. Well, it was really a bumpy road uh, from the first initiative till finally the meeting Nixon Mao took place. And there were several reasons, right? So for one, they haven't been talking with each other for like 30 years. So they didn't know each other, so that was very hard. And then, of course, the ideology was very, very different. Uh, I mean, Mao uh, was totally against the American imperialist, and of course, uh, Nixon uh, in the past has clearly stated that uh, he's, uh, he's a big enemy of, of communism or of communist China. Uh, so that was one thing. And then another one was that they had no direct channels. So they needed to use some back doors, and the main back door was uh, Pakistan and uh, the president of Pakistan, Yahya Khan. So their ambassador talked to, to, to Yahya Khan, and he then uh, talked to, to Mao or the prime minister, Zhou Enlai. So the discussions went forward and backward. And an additional difficulty was that uh, Mao's health was not at all its best. So one was never sure how that would uh, impact everything. And, and honestly, till finally that communique was signed in 1972, everything could have happened. So uh, it was not at all clear that it finally would take place. Well, then after forward and backward discussions, finally, finally, um, Kissinger went to, to, to China, to Beijing, uh, that was in uh, 19, in July 1971, to meet with Zhou Enlai, uh, the Prime Minister of, of, of China. That was the first meeting, and then two other meetings would follow, till finally then the meeting with uh, Mao and Nixon would take place. And actually, this meeting, this very first meeting, was uh, the most important. Basically, there, that was the base uh, that everything thereafter could happen. So, and by the way, uh, it was not that easy for Kissinger to go there. So, since uh, it was all top secret, he had to go through um, Pakistan. And then in Pakistan, and the official version, he was on, a, on an Asia trip. He, he flew secretly to China to meet with, with Zhou Enlai. And what was important is that, that Zhou Enlai was a really very, very experienced diplomat. Uh, 
Um, Kissinger back then was much younger, he was only 48. So Kissinger and Zhou Enlai really hit it off, mainly due to, uh, due to Zhou Enlai. So Zhou Enlai was very open, he created a very, very friendly atmosphere. He also was able to take criticism and especially uh, he knew a lot about, in detail about the United States. So um, Kissinger felt very, very well received and he was very, very impressed. And when then coming back to, to, to Nixon, uh, he told them that uh, next to uh, Charles de Gaulle, um, Joe Enlai was the most impressive uh, person, statesman he ever, he ever met. And during that time, they also clarified the points, the issues uh, which had to be dealt with, which had to be agreed on in, in, such, a, in such an agreement in the, the Shanghai Communique. And on the uh, Chinese side, it was very clear. The main and actually only uh, purpose which really was important for them was the Taiwan question. So they wanted the United States to agree that Taiwan is a part of China and that there is only one China. And Kissinger signaled uh, Joe Enlai that um, the United States will agree with that, which again was a big step because till then, Till then, there was no connection with, with the People's Republic of China and they were friends with Chiang Kai-shek and, uh, and with Taiwan. And basically there, they, they gave the signal um, that they were kind of ready to sell out uh, Taiwan. Though Kissinger made clear that that cannot be the only point um, because the, the priority for the USA was uh, the Indochine uh, question and uh, they needed to support uh, for resolving their issue uh, with the Vietnam War. But basically they agreed on the main points and Kissinger came back to Nixon and confirmed that it went all his way and that they were on a successful track. Thereafter, uh, two additional meetings followed. Uh, one was again with Kissinger. Kissinger went to Beijing again, but that was really to, to discuss the details. They could not fully finish it. So therefore, a bit later, he sent back uh, one of his guys um, to really do all the fine tuning for this coming UK. But it was very clear and there was a clear plan that everything should be settled and that Nixon would only go there, go to China uh, if everything was clear and if it was clear that it will be a success. And so when the day came that uh, Nixon uh, was to travel to, to Beijing, uh, it was mainly um, planned that he will meet with Zhou Enlai, the Prime Minister, and it was not all sure whether Mao could make it because his health was really not the best and a few weeks before he almost died. Uh, but that was no issue, there was no trouble because um, Mao was, was, was uh, fully updated and he always agreed with everything, so that was fully aligned with Mao. And as I said before, again, the two architects, the two architects for this success were uh, Zhou Enlai, and Edward Kissinger. And uh, in the end, the biggest credits, I would say, go to John Lai, who really did an amazing job uh, during, uh, during that time. Now, Nixon finally flew to, um, to Beijing together with his entourage. Also, Kissinger, of course, uh, was a part of it. Um, he arrived, and uh, again, it was not sure that he will meet with Mao. Uh, he arrived. He was received uh, with uh, his, his air when he st stepped out of the airplane. He was received by uh, Joe Enlai, Prime Minister Joe Enlai. There was this famous picture and this famous famous uh, handshake in between Nixon and, uh, and Joe Enlai. Um, he then went to the hotel and uh, all the meetings um, went on um, in order to confirm and, and rediscuss um, uh, this uh, Shanghai communique. But again, it was only fine tuning. Basically, everything was said, everything was clear. And then, as a quite big surprise, uh, short term Mao felt better and he invited uh, finally Nixon to, to meet with him. Uh, the meeting only was planned for 15 minutes. But then it uh, it uh, took uh, it took uh, it took an hour. But again, that was just some top level talk. Um, it changed nothing with uh, the agreement they already have prepared and with uh, the the Shanghai communique. And yeah, during that trip, uh, during Nixon's trip, there was still uh, uh, a thing which um, yeah caused some risk. Um, and and and, um, and there was a risk that that uh, that that 
signature of the Sunha community could not happen, and that was the State Department, the State Secretary of uh, the United States, because the State Secretary uh, of the United States, they totally were left out, so they were they didn't know what was going on. So the first time um, they learned in detail about it, and they were very surprised, was when they went on this trip and they arrived in Beijing in February 1972, and they were not happy at all. And they uh, rather tended to support their old friendship with Taiwan and were not at all interested uh, to, 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 to let Taiwan down like a hot potato, though that was essentially what happened. So it, it, it got critical. And there once, once more, uh, there was this, uh, this very experienced diplomat, Zhou Enlai. He sentenced these this, this difficulties and what he did, uh, he went to the state secretary, met with the state secretary, who was uh, many ranks below him. Uh, and he was already a, a person of history, if you will. So still, he went against every protocol. He visited him in his hotel room, shook his hand, talked to him, and asked him uh, to support the whole, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole negotiation and to support the signature of this Shanghai um, communique. Once more, there, Zhou Enlai uh, showed what great statesman he was. And so finally, it happened. They met. They had banquets. Uh, Nixon met with Mao, many pictures, um, communique was signed, it was a big success. It was a big success uh, for Nixon and also it was celebrated as a big success of Mao. Though, of course, uh, it's clear there was some backwash uh, in the US and also uh, on the side uh, of Mao in, in China. <laughs> in, uh, in the US, uh, one of the leaders who was totally against that uh, agreement was, was uh, Ronald Reagan, the future president of the United States. And also um, within China, of course, Mao had a very, very strong positions. He almost had no enemies left. But still, uh, there was some uh, communication uh, to be done. We learn from this for the future, especially how can it help, how that experience and those learnings can help to avoid a war in between China and, um, and uh, the United States. So now, where do we see parallels uh, concerning the situation back then and today? So one was the threat. There was a threat back then, there's a threat today. What was it back then? Back then, the threat for the, the United States was the Soviet Union and communism, right? So they were in the uprise, and uh, there still was a risk that the Soviet Union could again reunite uh, with, uh, with China, and if that would have happened, that would have given a very, very strong support to communism within the world, and, uh, and it could have uh, developed much, much stronger, and history would maybe have taken a different turn. Also for Mao, the Soviet Union was a threat, right? Because they had problems, they had troubles, they had fights along their border, and it was a probability that China and Russia could go into a nuclear war. So the threat was the Soviet Union. Today, what is the threat? The threat now, today, is that we're going to have a war in between China and the United States. And such a war would be disastrous. I don't believe it would be a nuclear war, but it would be a conventional war. And uh, we have the risk that it would be fought, not only between China and, and the United States, but across the world, right? So countries would be split, right? So Middle East maybe for China, um, Latin America, partially for the US, partially for China, Southeast Asia, mainly for China, uh, Africa, probably divided, half China, half the United States. So, you know, the lines would, would go across the country. So back then, that probably was the main driver for the President of the United States and for Mao to finally to get in, to an agreement. And it also should very clearly be the main driver today. Now, second, the Taiwan question. Back then and as today, the Taiwan question is the biggest issue. No Chinese leader will ever accept that China uh, and Taiwan are divided, that Taiwan is not a part of China, that there is not only one China. Never a leader, a Chinese leader, will accept it. So it's the very, very same question as we had in 1972. And um, also today, the biggest conflict which could cause a war would once more be the time in question, and that needs to be solved. It was not easy to solve it back then. It won't be easy this time, but it has to be solved. Then ideology and, and, and values, 
In the past, in 1972, those two countries, U.S. and China, they were miles apart. Right? So the U.S. turned against the communism, and for the Chinese, um, the the United States were the were the, were, were imperialist, uh, which they had nothing in common with. Today, clearly, of course, it I would say on both sides, um, the ideology has been increasing, nationalism has been increasing, but still, clearly. On both sides, the main driver is economy. So we have a difficult, a difficult situation here, but not as difficult uh, as in 1972. There, the two countries are still much closer together. They are by far not decoupled. And still the economy, especially in China, is the main driver. Then trust. How is the trust situation? So back then, the trust was very, very bad. It was not existent, actually. Right. So they had to start from zero, and when they signed this agreement, it was not based on trust, right? It was just based on trial and error. You know, let's set it up, let's set up something we can control, let's step by step build trust. How about trust then? Trust today and trust back in 1972. So back in 1972, trust was non-existent, right? Because those countries have not been talking for 25 years with, with each other, right? So there was no trust at all. It was very, very hard. Today, trust is not at its best. During the, the Trump-Biden um, period, um, there was, was harm to the, to, the, to the trust in between the parties, um, but it's by far not as bad as it used to be. But we should be not naive, we should be very clear. That trust has to be rebuilt and it cannot just be rebuilt by uh, having a few meetings, having some friendly chats and having some drinks and such, right? So it needs to be rebuilt. One needs to start at a point and even though trust is, is not fully there, one has to start at a point, step by step, in order to be able to build up trust. And I believe now, the most important, where do we have parallels in um, the solution approach? So first, mutual respect. So as I mentioned before, that was the key element why the whole the whole uh, agreement back back in 1972 was a success, right? So Joe and Lai met and with Kissinger, and they had they could build uh, they could build an environment of respect. And in order to show that, I just uh, would like to to read you the the quote uh, of uh, uh, Henry Kissinger. So that was his uh, opening speech at the very first meeting when meeting with uh, Joe and Lai, the Prime Minister of China. Quote. We are aware, of course, that there are deep ideological differences between us. You are committed to seeing your concepts prevail. We have our convictions for the future. The essential question for our relationship is whether both countries are willing to let history judge who is right. In the meantime, we deal together with matters of mutual interest based on mutual respect and equal rights for all people. Now. That is exactly how it has to be done, exactly like this, right? So we need the same approach as Kissinger and also on his side, Joe and Lai had. And there's a second parallel we see, agree to disagree. So when setting up that uh, Shantan communique, Mao had an excellent idea. So what he wanted is to have like a first section where China would state its opinion, uh, which of course uh, the US didn't agree with at all. Then in the second section, the US would state their points, their views, but which then China would not agree. And then in the third section, they listed their common points where both sides would agree on. So clearly they decided to agree, to not agree, right? They stated it, they, they wrote it down, and then they focused on the area where they could agree. And that is exactly uh, the way we should do it today. And here I wanna, wanna quote uh, a solution from uh, Kevin Roth from his latest book, uh, uh, China, the Avoidable War. So there he has a very, very similar an approach which is exactly based on that. So what he says, and I believe fully that is a, a very good approach. So first, the US and China they should agree on some rules on the red line, so they should agree which red lines cannot be crossed, one. Second, they should define the areas where they want to compete on, where they can compete on. And thirdly, they should define the areas where they can collaborate. That is the approach um, to go in order to find a solution. It won't be easy, but um, it is worthwhile.
right? Because once more, as back then, uh, it was also the, the thinking of Nixon and Mao, such an agreement, even with the most pessimistic outcome, is still better than the alternative. Because the alternative was bad to travel 1972, and it would be horrific this time. And the last point um, where we can uh, use the same approach as back in 1972 is the silent diplomacy, right? So back then, again, um, it was not public. Uh, they discussed everything um, behind closed doors. And the news only went to public when everything was already set and agreements were made. That's exactly the same we should do today. So parties should meet behind closed doors, should define the red lines, should define the areas where one can compete and should define the areas of, um, of uh, where they can collaborate. And by the way, that's exactly also the way uh, Kevin Rudd, uh, famous uh, Chinese, China expert, former, um, former uh, prime minister of Australia, he fully agrees with that. So I hope I could give you some insight I could give you some uh, food for thought. Please subscribe my channel in order to get more food for thought, hopefully. And please comment on that uh, video. Uh, tell me what you think. Do you have a different opinion? Did you know about uh, that, uh, that big uh, event back then in 1972 and about the big impact it, ha it had? Please comment below and see you soon.